Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Jenny Sandova for my tutor, for always editing my paper, keeping me on my toes, helping me form a lot of these metaphors and present this. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Nabil Iqbal, who is my mentor. He is the one who guided me through this project, actually came up with the idea and shared my enthusiasm as we found some of these really weird results. And then Professor Hong Lu, who oversaw the project. Mr. Nathaniel Thomas and Professor Dennis Uglini, who reviewed my work, went over my paper and gave me some feedback on it. And then, of course, MIT and CE for sponsoring and letting me have this opportunity. Any questions? Any questions from our judges? Yeah. So here you were, you were finding some sort of curves in the, uh, that gives the sort of minimal weighted surface area. I mean, if you apply, say, calculus of variations, do you get some sort of differential equation you can solve to describe these curves? Or how did you make these pictures? The question is, if you um, apply, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, calculus of variations, do you get some sort of differential equation that you can solve to describe these curves? Yes, actually, that's exactly what we did. If you look at this function, for the, this is actually functional for the surface area. And so to minimize this, I used the Euler-Lagrange formula to minimize the functional, and then it turned out a very big and ugly differential equation. And then I used Mathematica to numerically plot it, and that returned these solutions. Uh, are there any other questions from the judges? From the audience? How much do you, how much do you think you can, you can trust mathematics to be completely rigorous? Do you know anything about their implementation? Is it guaranteed not miss answers? Uh, the question is, um, how much can we trust Mathematica to be completely rigorous, and do we know anything about their implementation? So I think Mathematica is fairly accurate, but I will tell you a little story. We did have some troubles with it, like numerically plotting this, this donut solution that bends in, it kept breaking down right here because there's a vertical. So of course it's using the slope to determine where the next point is, so it kept breaking down. So we actually had to plot it as rho as a function of z and then use the initial conditions right there and then we got the shape. I think the fact that we got shapes like this are an indicator that Mathematica was being accurate in plotting the function and we know that Mathematica was really accurate because this function, the bull within a bull, the known solution from previous research, we knew exactly how that function behaved and the differential equation that I found that I used Mathematica to plot actually plotted that function exactly as we expected. All the way in the back. I know that log P like maps a lot of non perturbative problems in the quantum field theory, like perturbative problems in string theory. But is it possible to define like entropy for quantum field theories? Because I know you can have like von Neumann entropy and stuff like that in ordinary quantum mechanics, but can you like generalize quantum field theory in just the quantum space and not the string theory space? Um, is it possible to <laughs> So he's basically. Why don't you restate the question? So he's asking if you can generalize the entropy you calculate into a regular quantum space. I want to actually discuss the relation we use. It's actually the case holography is best understood as a specific case where you use anti de Sitter space relating to a conformal strongly coupled field theory. There's specific, it's a specific gauge of quantum field theory that this works for. And the great thing is, is it actually works both ways. Like you, if you have a quantum field there that it's easy to calculate the entanglement entropy of and you calculate it, well then you can also get the minimal surface area in the space time if the space time is really ugly. And the one we did was of course using the space time calculation in anti de Sitter space to translate to the conformal strongly coupled quantum field theory. Yes, another question? How long did it take for Mathematica to solve this? How long did it take for Mathematica to solve this? It took about, I think, five minutes for each iteration. It's actually not that intensive of a, of a process. Most of the 
time taken to actually do the experiment was doing all the mathematics and then figuring out why this kept cutting off and breaking down, which took a good one or two weeks, but then it was so cool when we got the shape, we were so excited. This question is, um, what is anti-de-sitter space at a conceptual level? Thank you for asking that. I was waiting for someone to ask about that. <laughs> no chalk? Oh, wait. Okay, we have chalk. So, first of all, for those who aren't familiar, in space-time, general relativity and special relativity use something called a metric to describe how something moves through space. So, for a flat space-time, the metric would look something like this. Okay, so what does that mean? So you guys know moving through a coordinate plane, just say a two-dimensional one, to find distances between two points, you use the Pythagorean theorem. Well, you guys see the dy squared plus the dx squared equals ds squared. This ds is giving you the distance. Well, in space-time, it's four-dimensional, so you also add the z dimension, and then the t1 in our calculation wasn't relevant because we weren't working with time. So this is the metric for flat space. So our space, anti de Sitter space, is a form of curved space-time. Specifically, it has a negative curvature. What that, the only difference in the metric is you have an over z squared. So that means as you travel in the z direction, the space actually, um, as z is really small, the space expands, obviously, because you're dividing by something very small squared. And then as you move into it, it contracts. That's important because that's the reason why this has the most surface area. The z is very small, so that space is actually expanding. The reason we have to use anti de Sitter space is because in our field theory, there's something called an ultraviolet cutoff around the edge, causing the entanglement entropy to go to infinity if you make the border around the edge of the circle really small, because there are infinitely number arbitrarily small entanglements occurring over very small distance. Like, for example, you saw in the Feynman diagram with the electron-positron pair, that's like a small entanglement. It happens over an infinitely small amount of time, but you have an arbitrarily large number occurring if you make the border really small. So the anti de Sitter space going to infinity as you travel in that makes z really small corresponds with our ultraviolet cutoff as it becomes really small, our entanglement entropy going to infinity. If there are no more questions, um, then thank you very much.